uh yes so um i was having to think about what to do this time because we obviously didn't have a an external speaker we've got a few things on the topic backlog which we're going to try and get booked in um but i was just thinking it might be a good opportunity just for the a few of us here anyway just to i don't know get a bit more up to date with what we're all doing and um yeah i put hopefully you saw i put three three bullet points in the external slack channel um just to spark the discussion think a little bit about what we're up to uh what maybe what some new technologies we've discovered in the last few months i've got a few things and if there's any gaps in the ecosystem uh and i'll be quite interested just to hear what you guys have to say i can make some some notes and paste it into the the uh document later and then it might help us uh think a little bit about what we could do in future in this group and what else we need from the from the community so I will start. Um, what I'm working on at the moment, we've done a bit of a uh, reorging inside my my team actually. So I've now got a couple of managers working for me, which is great. So this is uh, not specific to this group really, but just in terms of my workload, it's helpful. Um, what's not ringing me? Go away. Um, but internally in GR, what we're up to is um, obviously we we talk quite a bit about our Armada system, which is our um, system for high throughput computing on on kubernetes we've scaled that pretty big now so we've got um some thousands of nodes running in one of our data centers with um production workloads all flowing through it so the big thing we're doing at the moment is basically keeping that happy and well and then looking at what new features we need to add for our researchers to make them more productive so the core platform is working well but what we don't really have a good story for at the moment is um sensible observability for users so all of the uh, observability tends to be done through Grafana and metrics, so which is quite good for administrators, but not so good for users who just want to understand what's going on with their jobs and so forth. We've got some basic CLIs, but I think we really need to invest in the the user interface, the the, the actual UI, so that people can click around and understand what what's going on in this great big machine we've built for them. Um, in terms of new technologies we've been looking at in the last few months, um, something which I've uh, or we've started using to quite good effect is Envoy. So I think it's actually, it's, it's a CNCF project. It's something that I think Istio uses internally, but we just use it as a performant, very configurable um, HTTP proxy. So historically, for those sorts of things, we've actually used uh, physical appliances almost, which are quite hard to operate and difficult to configure. And now we can just do all of this in Kubernetes using using Envoy, which is really, really powerful and uh, yeah, easy to test and integration test and deploy changes to. So that's fantastic. Um, and in terms of the third bullet point, so what gaps I'm seeing at the moment, we're within our business anyway, we, we I still feel we're really missing a, um, a good quality cross cluster um, software defined network or software defined firewall. So we want the ability to be able to say workload A can talk to workload B or this type of thing can talk to that kind of thing, but not that kind of thing. And to be able to do that with strongly typed metadata across clusters would be really powerful. And I don't feel like we've got a good solution for that out there at the moment. And there's a couple of products we've looked at, which we've sort of then stopped using. So I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has a, any good, um, good options for that. But yeah, that's that's me. Um, I guess we'll go around and then I'll just make some notes and then we'll just chat about it afterwards. So uh, I don't know, uh, Jeffrey, you want to go? Sure. And I apologize again for the construction in the background. Um, so right now at ORNL, the for the, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computer Facility, right now the focus of all efforts is on Exascale and Frontier and getting that into a state where we can get the early science users on there in order to be able to actually start utilizing that resource um, for uh, their for determining results for their research. Uh, for the slate service running alongside of our compute clusters, our, our supercomputers, um, that work is probably gonna be pretty similar to what we already have in place um, since the users are familiar with it, but until until the early science users actually start getting on it, I, I can't actually start testing things. Um, so we'll see how we'll see when that happens as far as how that testing goes. So in the interim, what I've been working on lately more, uh, being an open shift shop, is 
working with uh, the advanced cluster management pieces. The CNCF upstream is open cluster management in order to be able to try to get the systems underneath a GitOps type workflow methodology that works with native OpenShift tooling in order to be able to manage multiple clusters across the board. Um, so that's that for OpenShift. Say again. It's ops for OpenShift, basically. Um, so advanced cluster management is the is the OpenShift piece, but the open cluster management piece, the open source one, actually can do um, it can actually manage just about any cluster. Um, it's not it's not tied into OKD up, upstream open source at all. And in fact, with um, OpenShift, you can they they say, and I haven't tried this yet, but they say that you can also manage other other Kubernetes uh, distributions as well using the same uh, software since it's just basically open cluster management with the Red Hat SO pieces rolled in with it, it looks like. So that's, that's a, a large focus of what I'm working on at the moment. And the reason why I'm working on that, my gap is people. <laughs> the great resignation is real and uh, it, it's hit us. It, it it's been uh, as people are adjusting workflows and things like that. I mean that's that's our biggest gap at the moment. What where are they going? What's what's going on there? Uh, so we've had one uh, go out move out to the west coast actually, um, for a large uh, corporation that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, we had one move to Red Hat, and then we had one move to. Um, uh, engineering group, uh, database engineering group in, for Kubernetes. So they're going to, and the last one, where'd he go? Hmm. Rantis? Where are you? Yeah, uh, where, where, where are you physically? Remind me. Tennessee, Tennessee. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So yeah, we're stuck. We're, we're the, we're the national lab that's in, in the middle of the green mountains. So. I made some notes. I'll um, I'll type it up in the in the um, doc later, and you can correct all my mistakes or typos. That's interesting. Uh, awesome. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yes. Um, who should we go for next? Nate. Yeah. Does your mic work? I remember you said your mic doesn't work. Let's find out. Does it? Ah, yeah. Oops. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just working on getting containers. Uh, Better container integration with Slurm. Okay. So the last release, we added the ability to call OCI runtime, OCI compliant runtimes. And now I'm working on making it a lot better. Nice. What's the setup there? Remind me, is it, who have you got working on this? You, obviously. Me. Just you. Yeah. You're the hero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the volunteer. <laughs> Awesome. I'm getting paid for this. I'm not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So how, how's that going? Uh, really good, actually. I got it working. Um, I'm just working on getting it to the point that I'm actually willing to share the source code with the, a reviewer. Mm -hmm. Who would that be? Um, it's just you. No, no, no. We have uh, all code that goes in the Slurm is reviewed by somebody who didn't write it. All oh, right, <clears throat> so it'll probably end up going to the CTO because it's a big change. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, it'll make life a lot easier and you know, let people who run Podman and uh, Docker use Slurm so much easier or if at all. Has there been any container integration before or, or other ways of doing yeah. that? Last release, I, <clears throat> I added the uh modifications to the daemon that runs on the nodes to actually call the OCI runtimes directly mm -hmm. and to handle a little bit of the magic for it and make it a containers first class citizen. So Slurm's actually aware you want a container and stuff like that. Um, admittedly, that was incomplete because I ran out of time and this is more of the work on it to actually make it friendly. But Slurm's actually had containers forever. It's just that everyone used them outside of Slurm or they used a uh, plugin to make it work. Okay, so it's really just native support in Slurm for. Uh, yeah, first class citizen. Yep. 
Um, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't know for the for you uh, if this will be applicable. But yeah, what, what is there any new technologies or things you've been using in the last six months? Other, or maybe this containerization, I suppose. Uh, a lot of the OCI specs. I have right. been diving into those very deep and figure out why Docker is insane and doesn't actually follow their own specs. <laughs> I hear that a lot. <laughs> or I guess more accurately, they just keep rewriting them whenever they feel like it. And the specs are moving target. Definitely. Um, especially since they don't actually use the OCI runtimes in a compliant way because they use the detach mode of C run, which isn't even in the spec at all. But eh, I got it. Just takes a little while sitting there with debugger. Like, why are you doing this, Docker? Why? Are people generally wanting to use Docker, do you think, still? Or is it, I think we're obviously seeing a lot of people moving away from it with um he's not supporting it in the future. I mean, well, I've seen that although Jeff could probably get better word on this, is that Podman's coming in pretty popular with our uh DOE crowd. Um, but Docker has always been the one that users have asked for it, as far as I'm aware. They just want the thing to work. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Podman, you could just do as an alias of Docker and it works. Yeah. I was under the impression yeah. Podman was for sort of humans to use, but you wouldn't use it on servers, like through Slurm. Is that right? Oh, my God, that. I'm fixing that. <laughs> <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, the user should never have to worry, understand, or care about how it works. It just should work. Mm. And then, you know, the system admin can do the, you know, the fun work of setting up storage. And yeah, we've been, if if they aren't building their if they aren't building their images in OpenShift, then we've been having direct users to use Podman as well in order to be able to run their images. But uh, running through Slurm, I, I believe they run using Singularity. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Singularity's been around for quite a while now. And it's new happy fork of Aptainer. So I heard an interesting question about singularity, and I originally thought it might be possible, but I don't think it's true possible. Could you use singularity as a container runtime for Kubernetes? And I'm thinking that's impossible. Um, actually, Scilabs is working on that as we speak. Oh, OK. Uh, they have partial OCI support in the current release, but the next big, next major release, they're supposed to be fully OCI runtime compliant. Well, that's interesting. At first, I thought it was just a question from a naive person, and then I thought, hmm, maybe uh, you uh, you confirmed that it might be possible then. Yeah, uh, Scilabs posts all their uh, plans online. You have to find a link for it, but it's part of their uh, plan of record. And I want to note that I have nothing to do with site labs, completely independent. <laughs> you just reminded me as well, um, completely unrelated, but the same name. There's a, a white paper or something that's come out of Microsoft about something they've created called Singularity, which is not, not a container runtime, but it's some kind of large scale resource scheduler. I don't know, has anyone heard of that? Uh, Microsoft has been throwing large amounts of cash at their Azure HPC stuff. Mm. Um, hiring out tons of people. For all I know, the uh, guy who left Ornell went did there. <laughs> I don't know anything else. Then. Yeah, yeah, it looked it looked quite new. It was just a paper. It had about twenty authors on it. It was massive. It was quite thick, and it seems to be an all singing, all dancing resource scheduler equivalent to something like Condor or Slurm, I suppose, but with the hardware as well. I don't know. It, and it sounded like it did all sorts of magic things around. Oh, you mean the one that uh, Greg's working on? So it's not some singularity. It's um, it's their container orchestrator. It sounded well. Uh, it, it definitely pulled, I haven't got it to hand actually, but yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. What they called it? Yeah, it's, it looks like a competitor to Kubernetes. Yes, yeah, uh, possibly. The name of it is. It might be something else. Yeah, I'll find it. Um, and then, yeah, uh, last question then, uh, Nate. I don't know, any gaps in the ecosystem or areas that you're working that you need plugged other than the Docker? Oh, no lack of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but you know, it's just the usual process of development. Just finding out what's broken, fixing it. Um, for the most part, the st OCI standards are really helpful. Most mm -hmm. people follow them at least somewhat. My, the most amusing part about the OCI standards is they actually don't standardize what any of the runtime arguments are. <laughs> they just have the general suggestion of what each thing should do. For the most part, most people seem to go with the run C path, but uh, I've seen a few who don't. All right, I'll take some notes. Cheers. Uh, cool, thanks. Uh, Timothy, questions to you then. Uh, yeah, I just need to find my mute button, unmute button, and all this mess. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been working through the system on Kubernetes capabilities from a researcher's and, R and an RCD professional's perspective. So we, I've done Fabric. Um, so I had to build a, Kube, uh, a Kubernetes cluster using kubeadmin um, and a mixture of Python and Cloud in it. Uh, Jetstream two was similar. Uh, Anvil has a, a Kubernetes cluster, small one, uh, using R Rancher, and that's another U.S. Uh, national system, about a thousand nodes. Um, previously to that, I'd played with uh, the Pacific Research Platform, also known as Nautilus, soon to be known as the ERN, uh, which used to be called the Eastern Regional Network, and it's a distributed Kubernetes cluster for researchers with GPUs. Um, and so I've just been looking at it from, you know, how easy would it be for somebody who wanted to, as a researcher or somebody supporting researchers to, to leverage these technologies. So uh, that's kind of what I've been up to doing um, and just evangelizing the use of Kubernetes as a, as a way to kind of abstract use from the public cloud and things like that. So uh, given the complexity and cost of, of the, the public cloud and the more and more uh, national systems that are are using it uh, in a researcher's perspective. How, when you say distributed, what, what do you mean? Like how distributed? Uh, for PRP and Nautilus, um, they're across the country. They have like, they're doing Ceph across hundreds of miles. Um, uh, they have, have 500. GPUs and I'm guessing they don't have a few tens on each location. So they may have, I don't, I should look at what it is, but they may have like 20 or 30 different locations. Um, they have storage, maybe five or six different locations. Uh, so it, it's, it's rather interesting. Uh, same with, uh, fabric fabric is a, an experimental network. Um, and so you can get nodes across the country that are connected via hundred gig plus, uh, networks. And you say, I want to, I want to. Uh, I want a, a, a card all to myself. And so I built a Kubernetes cluster on top of that. Thanks. In terms of new technology, um, I've been playing with Kubemin and CloudNet systems uh, recently. Um, and in my beer time at home, um, I've built a Pi Kubernetes cluster from scratch. Um, and so my constraints on that, just because it's fun was to, to build it only using a Docker container, um, and it's, uh, container D and IPv6 only. And uh, so I can, I can build it and tear it down anytime I want. Um, and it's only it starts with a Docker container and right now on the, I've got it up and running and now I'm trying to make it self-hosting. So it will provision itself. You said Pi at the beginning of that, as in yeah. raspberry oh. Pi. Nice. Is that on so one or multiple of those plugged in? Uh, I have, I want to get more, but I have uh, a controller node and two worker nodes, and then I have a provisioning node as well. So the provisioner runs Docker and, and runs the, uh, runs the uh, pixie boot and all that on top of it. And the plan is, is once it gets bootstrapped is that the cluster takes over that capability. Very so. good. That's pretty cool. So do you have people staring at you wondering what you're doing with these? No, it's my beer time. So um, <laughs> I grab a beer and sit in front of the TV and listen to music and pound away. So, uh, you know, it's the opportunity to do something slow and do it right. And um, I haven't played with, seriously played with Linux for a number of years. So just relearning things like system D and network D and all those kind of neat things from a, a deep perspective. So that's very cool.
I have a Raspberry Pi. I need to dig it out. I even bought a cool little case for it, but I haven't used it for anything recently. I actually, it's, I, sorry, go on. It's pretty capable, um, and it's a. I think it, it's a would be a great tool for sysadmins trying to learn how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster because it they're capable enough and fast enough to do that. Yeah. I, the last thing I did get it to do, I had a I had a button, an external button, and a speaker. And I could get it so that I pressed a button and it told me my train times at my local station before I left for work. So I knew that they were running late or not. That was quite good fun. That's um, cool. My next project is to uh, watch the RPI locator uh, to see when they come for sale and uh, put alarm off and uh, flash some lights so I know when to go buy one. So. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's cool. uh, yeah. And then, so yeah, the final question around the, the gaps in the ecosystem or anything you're looking for. so you know in in the research computing and data area not a lot of the applications are cloud native so they won't run well in containers and so one project i've been doing lately is been trying to get open on demand to run it inside kubernetes as a as a container um, having a little bit of success with that with talking uh, to some of the folks that are working closely with that that project so um the other one is a lot of these systems national systems don't have uh, the ability to kind of click and deploy uh, as a user um, to create a Kubernetes cluster, you'd have to build it on your own. And I think the researchers would do well to, to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, and then just from my, my experience and seeing how things are done, I think a simple provisioning system would be nice. I mean, you don't need some of these really heavy provisioners to build a cluster in terms of, uh, uh, I can't, Foreman, is that? Uh, yeah, and some of the other ones, it'd be nice to just have a simply pixie boot in and bring up a, uh, a node for Kubernetes. Yeah, I think that's always a challenge. We've made it as easy as possible in our environment to build clusters, but it's still not a one click thing. I guess, I don't know about you guys, but we don't tend to, because we don't give like cluster as a service to people we have like namespaces on shared clusters we haven't really had to completely streamline that building a cluster process if ricardo was here he might have a view because i know they do do that sort of model of spitting out whole clusters for people so maybe they have got an interface like you know gke like thing i don't know so so, think... so part of my early ex uh, exploration for beer time made me realize that they're all pretty heavyweight i didn't as you know deploying um, what's the OpenStack provisioner seemed rather overkill for for doing a, a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, is that Magnum? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I don't remember what it is. So, you know, if that was my day job, I would I would have reservations for that. And that for beer time, it definitely was not worth going down that route. Because yeah. I see what it took my team to 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 maintain an OpenStack and build main, build and maintain an OpenStack cluster. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Cool, thanks. Uh, Alex, let's just uh, shout up. Hey. Hey. How How's are you? Going? Good. Be good. Are you, you're West at the moment, aren't you? Say so, so again? You're West Coast at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, early. I thought I would have a meeting for the first half an hour of this hour, but whoever it was totally stood me up. So anyway, I'm joining this in protest. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if you saw my notes on the um, on the Slack channel around what we're doing. No. That's fine. I can ambush you then. So um, we haven't got an external speaker this time, so we're just doing some open discussion around, around a few things. But it'll be interesting just to everyone to update each other on what we're working on, um, any new technologies you've been playing with in the last six months that you might find interesting for other people. And... If there's any gaps in the ecosystem at the moment that you particularly want to be have filled, so go. No, we no, doing? No gaps. No, uh, it's all fine. Um, what I've been up to? Well, a large part of my last week has been organizing the batch working group, the CNCF batch working group stuff, um, and doing a bunch of outreach to try and collect as many people to that conversation as possible. Um, so Nathan, you were in there already, I think. Um, so hi, um, Jeff I, and Tim. Um, th hey, 
there's a, a conversation going on that came out of the a discussion with the tag runtime uh, group, whatever they're called, um, where we were asked to spin up a conversation, a working group around batch at the CNCF level. There's already a conversation going on at the Kubernetes level for batch, but there was a, a sense that we wanted to have a conversation at a higher level and um, discuss uh, how, in particular, all the, the sort of projects that like Armada and Volcano and Q Unicorn and MCAD and like, there's a long list on Slurm and Condor and how all of those things interact with Kubernetes that we felt that there was a discussion to be had there. So um, I'm helping run that working group uh, discussion and just trying to get a hold of it and try and gather interested parties towards it. Um, so that's one thing that I've been doing that might be interesting to this crew here. Um, have you found, uh, have you found it getting hold of the, the folks over sort of uh, Asia ways? So a lot of people in Volcano and Klaus and others in China, are you finding it all right contacting them? I mean, I, I've been okay sort of asynchronously chatting with Klaus. Um, I'll ask him for access to the working group, uh, Google group, and he'll eight hours later give it to me. And But we haven't had many people actually join. And we had started by having the meeting at something like seven o'clock our time so that it was 10 o'clock their time or something like that. Um, but it turned out that they that they would never actually join anyway. So I think we're probably going to have to do something like uh, what Cloudera does with Ozone, where we just have a Western countries meeting on one hand and then an APAC meeting at some other point. But I think what I need to do first is to just get a critical mass of people in one of them, and then I'll try and populate the other. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, because there, there is a big crew of people who we want to have in that conversation from Asia, but uh, yeah, just getting a hold of them is hard. So, yeah, from uh, a researcher's perspective, that that would be a huge capability for the adoption of uh, Kubernetes in in a wide variety of areas. Yeah, and you know, the the Kubernetes conversation. Uh, the batch conversation that's at the Kubernetes level is all talking about this project Q and what changes need to occur in the jobs API and in the scheduler and you know, all the places where you know, things need to be fixed to be able to run batch stuff, really. Um, so that might be an interesting conversation for you as well if you're interested in low-level Kubernetes stuff. Um, but assuming that things get fixed at that level, it probably implies changes to everybody else who, are, who have built things at a higher level. What are those implications? How does it change our worlds? How does it enable all of the rest of everyone to actually do batch on Kubernetes? That's what the CNCF conversation wants to look at. Yeah. Um, in terms it of might be the case that people end up going so far down the roads they're on that it's difficult for them to wind back to using something fundamental when it, even if it ever does exist. Yeah, um, I mean, we may be in that situation. Um, you know, there's and there, there's a real sense that after your team, Jamie, gets years worth of experience running a system, uh, yeah. you now have that as a real skill and you won't want to change to something else just because there's a that'll be an upheaval and yeah. we're, we're running lots of stuff on it already. So, you know, who knows what will happen when we get to that point. Yeah, everyone's got a certain amount of commitment in whatever they're doing, aren't they? They don't want to just suddenly go, oh, right, I'll just throw all that away and use this thing, use this other thing. I mean, ideally, there's some sort of progression where new features come available in lower level Kubernetes and Armada can look at it and go, oh, actually we can rip out a chunk of our system because 
now we can actually rely on the jobs API directly. And yeah, maybe you just end up hollowing your thing out until there's nothing left. Yeah, exactly. For, for us, maybe it just becomes a meta scheduler on top of Kubernetes jobs API. Yeah. And that it's as simple as that kind of thing. Um, you know, because until kubefed is a thing that you can actually federate multiple Kubernetes clusters also natively in Kubernetes, you'd still need something like what Armada provides, even if below that, the scheduling is actually done by Kubernetes as it should be. Yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed. So anyway, that's the that's the, exactly the kind of question that we hope to entertain in the uh, CNCF batch working group. Um, so that's one large thing I've been working on. The teams that I have on, in the OSPO are working on all sorts of projects. You know, Armada's uh, an ever increasingly uh, big project of ours. Um, but we also do a bunch of work in directly on ML and data science tools. Um, you know, Spark, Caravod, Ray, uh, Arrow, all of that kind of universe, like GBM. I don't know. You could go down the list. Um, uh, are there any particular open source tools that all of you or all of your research teams use currently? I'm just curious whether any of them are ones that we're contributing to. Well, you know we are. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, Jeff, Jeff had to drop. I guess the question might just be for Tim. Yeah, and I more take the perspective of a research computing and data professional, so they support all the things, you know. So. Yeah. Well, you know, presumably everything that your teams are using are things that we're either contributing to or might contribute to because it's all open source and it's all stuff that we use to. So. Uh -huh. um, so there's, there's, there's that kind of stuff that's uh, going on. I suppose uh, we've been doing one uh, project in Kubernetes security, looking at user namespacing and um, giving researchers root access in a secure way. And it, the person that I have working on that has some pretty promising results, like can confirm that he can do all sorts of things safely you know, the, with some caveats. Um, also, part of that project is looking at various eBPF things around Cilium and um, uh, maybe Tetragon. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, that's, that's also work that we're doing. Um, what other things have done? What have I played with recently? Um, you know, I've been looking at the, one of the things that I've been wrestling with is data science and machine learning. The ecosystem is is really confusing. There's either you have to sort of cobble it all together yourself and really understand how each part works and how each part will interact with each other, or you can go with these one-stop shop. Uh, all-in-one solutions where just use our platform and you will have notebooks through to production model serving. And there doesn't seem to be much in between. And so I've been trying to go through the millions of data science platform offerings that are currently out there and trying to figure out which, which ones offer which parts and which things we actually want as G research and uh, just trying to get um, you know, viewpoints on that. Um, you know, we, I was looking at Predibase, for example, which has some nice pieces to it. Um, it's that's from the guy who uh, did Horovod and Ludwig AI, and it builds on top of Ludwig and uh, there's some cool things about it. Might be cool for our NLP people because it packages up hugging face models, which currently our researchers have to email to themselves to get inside G Research, and then the email fails because the models are too big, and then they have to go through a whole. Pro it's a terrible, terrible thing. 
Um, so, you know, I was looking for a solution for them there. But that it's a platform that includes a whole bunch of other things that we already do well inside G Research. So they wouldn't need those things. So for us, we want sort of this composable data science uh, ecosystem that doesn't really exist unless you sit down and you wire everything together, which is what G Research has done. And I don't know, I'm just, I've just been sort of casting about the, the ecosystem, trying to figure out if there's a better way than the way that we've done it. Mm. Does any of that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Is everyone else cobbling things together? That's the question, I suppose. Yeah. Probably. I mean, I don't know. From speaking to others on these calls previously, it sounds like the answer is yes. I don't think everybody has a choice. No, <laughs> that's it. That's that's what you have to do. You want it to work the way you want it, you have to cobble it together. Your stuff's uh, standard, nothing. Yeah, unless you're a small data science shop where maybe you could choose one of these all-in-one platforms which will eventually be outdated pretty quickly. And so then you're stuck as a small data science company being like, I don't know whether I want to do this because it might be ugly for me later. So I'm going to cobble it together myself anyway. And Outdated or abandoned. Right, right. So you can only reuse it like a one-stop shop if you're coming, starting from a sort of, if, if you're at a starting point and then you use it and build around it. Like if you have any kind of pre-existing infrastructure or software or anything then it's difficult to then just go oh i'll just use this one-stop shop because it yeah. won't fit so i don't know you know nobody's really solved this the ecosystem it feels like this particular solar system of products is you know still in the sort of large bodies of gas forming you know bits of rocks colliding into each other and eventually there'll be planets that you can visit but uh, yeah nothing's really really come of it yet so yeah no we are in the sort of primordial soup yeah basically. yeah that's, that's a good one yes primordial soup <laughs> data science yes Love oh, it. just looking around waiting to evolve <laughs> so anyway that's i mean I suppose that answers question two and three. Yeah. Like, uh, it's kind of what I've been working on is looking around at the hole in my heart of data science land. Yeah. So I was missing its uh, maturity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a single answer. I just want a single answer, Jamie. I just <laughs> want somebody to tell me how it works, and then I'll just do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might be you might be waiting a while, but yes, <laughs> it's a virtue I think to to ask for it. But... Yeah, yeah. No, hey, Dave, you're on there too. Did I miss your uh, your update? Do you have a Dave? Oh, we do have Dave. Hey, Dave. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you what Dave's working on. It's got Armada team valiantly working away uh, on Armada. Oh, yeah. We've also got the Ozone team doing um, snapshotting for Apache Ozone um, and some other pieces too in Ozone land. Um, and then a, a bunch of things in F sharp and C sharp developer productivity land, just trying to improve build times and new get restores and all sorts of evil, horrible things in the Microsoft ecosystem. So, um, yeah, good stuff over there. But... Sounds like fun. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. I think that's we've been through everyone. I've been typing up some notes. Um, very amateurishly in notepad so i'll try and take all the typos out and pop it into the google doc and then if you want to go back and look and fix anything that i get wrong that'd be cool um other than that i think we've got so this next session will be in two weeks looking at the calendar so yeah third of august um i'll chat with ricardo i 
think he's back by then. Um, I'll be around as well, so we'll see if we can get... I'd really like to have that Cilium and EBPF session. Um, we do have someone lined up to talk, so we'll try and get that sorted mm. um, and take it from there. That's great. Well, if that happens, I'll invite David Ledbetter, if he can join at this time. It might be super late at, in Australia, but... Um, uh, yeah, it will be pretty antisocial for him. <laughs> Yeah, it might be one of, one in the morning or something like that. Oh, I think it'd be worse than that. Oh, really? Where is he, Sydney? He Melbourne? Oh, actually, no, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, one in the morning. Uh, he has a little kid. Maybe he'll be up. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, but he's the he's the person who's working on uh, the username spacing and EPPF stuff, so. Nice. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Okay, I'll chat with Ricardo and I'll, I'll let you know. Right on. Brilliant. All right. Unless there's anything from uh, Nate or Tim? Nope. Awesome. Just working. Right. Have a good day, everyone. Cool. See ya. Stay cool. Bye. Yeah, cheers. Bye.